Now we have a better idea of what we mean by life. Let's talk about trying to find it, trying to better understand it. Part of that falls under this topic of astrobiology. This is a huge field. All right. If you try to be an astrobiologist, you're talking about learning a large range of discipline, disciplines. Not just being an astronomer, but being a biologist, being a chemist, being a physicist. It's a large, multidisciplinary field of study. So you need to study a wide range of topics and work with a wide range of experts in order to make progress here. But what does astrobiology cover? Let's look at this picture here. We're looking at gas clouds. Some of these gas clouds surrounding stars. And what we'll find sometimes are complex molecules in them. Those molecules, the gas clouds themselves, these are remnants of previous stars. So even when we scan the cosmos, we just look at the dust and debris that's just floating out there, not bounded to any planet, we're still finding complex molecules. So when we're studying astrobiology, Things else that we can talk about is say like the origin of life, its evolution, how it's distributed across the universe, and potentially even its ultimate fate. A subset of astrobiology, the origins of life, is this abiogenesis. In simple terms, we're asking, hey, how did life come out of non-living matter? How do you go from just mud and rock to microorganisms? So in essence, abiogenesis is trying to identify what are the natural processes for the simple non-living living matter to turn into living matter. Some things that we do know about abiogenesis, about that origin of life, it was multiple processes happening simultaneously. There could have been a soup of organic material sloshing around in this water powered by some thermal vent. There could have been a comet that deposited a lot of water or deposited more complex molecular compounds on this planet. So it was probably this chain reaction of multiple things happening simultaneously. It is highly, highly unlikely that life just spontaneously figured out out of just one single incident. It had to be very likely this multiple complex process happening on top of each other. But the emphasis, what we do know about the origin of life is that evolutionary processes took over and started making more and more complex things. All you need for evolution processes, I'm not even talking about living things yet. I'm talking about a bubble of soup that has a bunch of different reactants in there just oozing around, chemically reacting. And what's powering it is energy. Energy coming from our sun, an example of Earth. We're getting fueled constantly by this outside source. And so processes here are able to absorb that and use that to grow in complexity over time. So one model under this abiogenesis idea is a famous experiment called the Miller-Urey experiment. And it starts with a simple hypothesis. Hey, Earth had a lot of simple inorganic precursors and the young Earth's reactions just built up the complex organic compounds. So we're looking at here is a picture of a young Earth <clears throat> somewhere between four and two and a half billion years ago where it has this kind of orangish tinge uh, oxygen isn't flooded into the atmosphere yet by life. So the idea here is that take the material that's just present at this young early earth and see what happens. So our experiment is to just simulate. Hey, there's life on earth. Idea. Hey, the material that turned into life was present on earth. So here's how the experiment goes. You give yourself some water. You boil it up, you heat it up. Right? Earth is a hot planet, just formed from a cream material. It's got sun, nice and boiling us to turn that water into a gaseous state. So you get water, and you have a chamber filled of gas. And these gases are going to be what we call a primitive atmosphere. 
So the ratio of, say, water, methane, ammonia, and dihydrogen in that, in that uh, atmosphere, we know that from samples studying the young Earth's atmosphere. So to recap, take one chamber filled with atmospheres in the proportions that we know are present in a young, primitive Earth. Get some water, boil that. All right, just get some uh, soup, as I like to call it. Soup boiling around, because you have water sloshing around, and add a little bit of electrical sparks, and a sort of lightning happening in the atmosphere. And that's the experiment. Here is your primitive Earth model, some heat sources to bubble it, some sparks to simulate lightning, and see what happens. And you know what we found? Amino acids. At the end of this experiment, these molecules, these gases in this water, started producing at least 20 different amino acids. And remember, the amino acids is what constructs the complex proteins that construct us. So the miller experiment doesn't confirm the origin of life, but it gives us ideas on where it could have started. And so it's very likely that on Earth, life began in the oceans where you have a sea material that can slosh and mix around the different chemicals and give them the ability to go through chemical evolution. Remember, organic molecules are going to need an external, external source of energy. And so as they chemically react, they'll fragment and reassemble. And that's a process of chemical evolution, something that can break down, reassemble, break down, reassemble, but maybe a slight change. And then you repeat that over and over again until more complex things can come out. As long as there's external energy, like thermal vents or the sun, this can continue. So the earliest known life forms are found around these hydrothermal events. I'm just going to timeline of this. About 4.5 billion years ago, Earth forms. About 4.4 billion years ago is when the oceans start to come about. And very quickly, only about 3.5 billion years ago, do we start to have evidence of the microorganism fossils. So life could predate as early as 4 billion years ago. What we're looking at here are stromatolites. You see these different layers. These are examples of uh, fossilized cyanobacteria building on top of each other. So these fossil materials date as far back as 3.5 billion years ago. And this is the earliest origins of life. These are the stromatolites that you can see lying around. And when you zoom in on them, that's where you see the, the layers about this. So one of the implications of this is that life became stable, started to propagate around this planet shortly after what's called the bombardment period. Remember, early in a planet's life, going all the way back to the accretion idea of the planets accreting out of material that didn't fall into the protostar, and you had that accretion disk. Well, as these protoplanets are swirling around, clearing their neighborhoods, there is this bombardment. Material is getting crashed onto the surface of the planet. So, this, the timeline of this seems to suggest that once the surface stabilized, that new material wasn't constantly being dumped onto the surface, life could finally reach a stable point and start to propagate on this planet. So when you have energy, you have external energy, and you have simple things becoming more complex, this is evolution. Start with the simplest. Say you have a self-replicating molecule, just basically some molecule in a supermaterial, and through whatever chemical reactions, it can make a copy of itself. Remember, the energy is still present. Earth has tons of energy to fuel these processes. So you've got your simple molecule, and it's replicating itself and mutations to occur. It could fold in on itself differently. It could just be a slightly related variation of material. Either way, there's variance. That's what's important. There's variance in what's there. Now, some of those variances are just not viable. Those things don't continue to make new permutations themselves. Others can. And so you have this new generation of that molecule that can keep 
representing, twisting, and changing itself. Well, they'll reproduce. Reproduce as in replicating themselves. And you'll get branches that maybe fall into places where they can't keep going, but the new chain can. Basically, the favorable mutations continue to exist, continue to dominate, and reproduce, making more and more copies. So, as long as you have something that is trying to replicate itself, and there is variance, mutations can occur, there can be evolution. So to recap that, any system that involves there being hereditary information, traits that are passed down from generation to generation, and as long as there can be random variants or mutations, that system will evolve. Plain, simple fact. If there is information being passed along from generation to generation, whether it's a living organism or just some molecule going through its chain of chemical reactions, as long as there is variance and replication, evolution must happen. One way to describe it is through this natural selection. In essence, we can say that for living organisms, the ones that are best adapt to survive in their environment will produce more offspring. And by producing more offspring, that will drive evolution. A classic example of this, you've got the dark or light moth and which one's better adapted to survive? Well, we'd say the ones that do a better job of blending in with their environments. In this picture here, it'd look like the dark ones are less likely to survive because predators are going to do a better job of, sp of spotting these moths and eating them up. But, and this really did happen, there was this huge sweep of, honestly, pollution that started to kill the moths, the lichens here, and that made, made the color of the trees change ever so slightly. And now all of a sudden, the dark moths do a better job of blending in with their environment. Whereas the lighter ones <clears throat> got picked up by the birds, eaten more often. And so something as simple as a slight change in the environment shifted the evolutionary pressures, shifted who was the better survivor. One a misconception that's constantly thrown out there about evolution is this idea of survival of the fittest. You know, the biggest, strongest, fastest thing lives. No. Uh, all, all, all you need for natural selection is who, honestly, does the best job of reproducing? Who gets to live the longest? It's not about being bigger, faster, stronger. It's about being adapted to survive the longest in your environment and produce the most offspring. If you have more questions about evolution, I highly recommend this TED, this TED video talk uh, describing the evolution of the eye, how natural processes could produce the eyeball of a human being or any other organism on the earth. So I'll make sure there are links connecting to this video, you know, because I strongly encourage anyone who has questions about evolution to watch a video like this. I will talk about one thing from it. And it's this idea about the human eye blind spot. And this is something that we actually know about. You can test this right now on your monitor. All right. This is mentioned in the video. That's why I bring it up. So what I want you to do is to cover your left eye and focus on the letter R. Now just lean in or lean away from your screen until you reach the point that the letter L disappears. You might have to play the distance between your face and the screen, but you will find that. Or suddenly, as you stare at this letter, the other one goes away. And what do you see there? You don't see a blank spot. Well, you see this bluish background color instead. There literally is a blind spot in your vision. You just can't see anything there. It's impossible. But your brain does this amazing thing where it just fills in the blind spot. And so when you put the L in that position where you can't see anymore, your brain says, hey, what's around it? I can't see anything here. Everything here is a blind spot. So I see a bunch of blue and your brain just 
fills the hole with the blue. Fascinating. I absolutely love talking about this. By mapping what we call the phylogenetic tree of life, we're able to see how all the different species on this planet are related to each other. DNA was one of the most conclusive evidence of evolution taking place. So to break this big thing down, what you have is what was called the last universal common ancestor. Now, whether it was one organism or a couple, there's some debate there, but basically all life started to spawn out of one branch, one tree. And it split into three main areas, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryas. Obviously, we come out of the eukarya chain from the animals, and even from the animals, just going down to the primate branch. Bam, bam, bam. All right, humans to our nearest relatives that for now, the evidence points to chimpanzees being the closest living organisms to humans. All the way down the primate branch. So by mapping DNA, by mapping the DNA sequences, we're able to connect all of the wonderful, complex, varied organisms on this planet to one source. We all evolved out of the material that was oozing, bubbling around four billion years ago. So that first living organism, that earliest life, it would have been what's called an extremophile. Extremophile, big definition here, is basically any microorganism that can live in extreme conditions. It doesn't have to be all of these. It can be just one specific one. But it can live in, an extremophile can be found in regions of extreme temperatures, either super hot or super cold, or the picture shown here, extreme acidities. This is literally, this is uh, the River Tento in Spain. The pH level of this is two. Now, uh, for references here, uh, a pH level of 7 is water, right? What, what you want to drink. If you're having soda, maybe you'll have a pH of uh, maybe close to 8, not quite there. So as you go higher up in this basic scale, you'll start getting to ammonias and lyes. You start getting to basics 14 or acids towards the 7. So, so your lemon juice or battery acids between 1 and 2. This is what we mean by being acidic. So this Rio Tinto River is literally a river of acid. And we find organisms thriving in it. Honestly, it's very difficult to find places on Earth where something is not living there. It is very difficult. It's probably better to try and find... It's easier to say hey, that organisms are going to live basically everywhere on this planet. Because where they can't live is very, very minute. So, recapping this, bringing this all back around, those first organisms were probably extremophiles. Things that just thrived in these definitely extreme environments. Related to that, here's a picture of the Grand Presmatic Spring, and we see the different colors around this. Well, those colors are produced by these mats of bacteria that's photosynthetic. These bacteria are producing energy by absorbing photons, and the ones they reflect is giving off their colors. These are called cyanobacteria. And so the very first life forms were probably were called prokaryotic ancestors of these cyanobacteria. Remember we talked about those fossilized regions, the stromatolites? the material that would have been the first living organisms, those things were probably the first ancestors. The things that eventually came are modern cyanobacteria and their cousins, us, if we're being perfectly honest. <laughs>